Hi Pierluigi, how is life? <laughs> oh fine, how are you Adriano? Very well. Very good, and you? Everything okay? Yeah, yeah, things are going uh, well. We have lots of um, lots of interesting stuff coming up. You will hear about it. <laughs> yeah, we're looking forward. So let me just start because I get here the sign that we can start the meeting. And I would like to welcome uh, all of those online who have uh, connected for this uh, workshop on neuroinflammation. Uh, let me just tell you a few words about uh, about this meeting. This is a uh, meeting on inflammation and immunological responses in neurodegenerative diseases, and it's been organized uh, in the context of uh, the Preserving the Brain project, which has been supported, is supported by the Prada Foundation. Um, I think that the importance of uh, neurodegenerative, in neurodegenerative diseases of inflammation and immune responses is growing, and uh, there is a general understanding that they may be uh, very critical for the development of, of these conditions, in addition, of course, to other biological processes, but the role of inflammation per se in, for example, propagation of misfolded proteins or in activation of microglia or in, even in autoimmune reactions is, uh, is becoming more and more relevant. So today we have the pleasure of having uh, three top scientists talking to us about these reactions. Um, I will introduce them as they uh, as they are coming to speak. The few general housekeeping uh, informations for those who attend the meeting. The first one is that uh, questions can be placed via the chat uh, function of Zoom, and uh, I will direct them to the speakers. Uh, the questions can be asked in a way that the speakers are going to answer at the end of the talk, and if there is any general um, question, will be then posed at the end of the meeting. Uh, one change in our program is unfortunately, um, Dr. Simmons has uh, got corona just yesterday and apparently is, uh, is pretty ill with fever and so he couldn't, he couldn't join us, which means that we are going to have only three uh, out of the four planned uh, presentations. So without any further ado, let me just introduce you to Professor Adriano Aguzzi, who is director of the Institute of Neuropathology at the University of Zurich, and uh, he's been one of the world leaders in studying both the molecular basis and the immunology of prion pathogenesis, but also about the neurodegenerative diseases using a wealth of technologies, and is also the founder and the director of the Swiss National Reference Center for Prion Diseases. Uh, so, uh, without tell, telling all the lists of honors and, and uh, uh, awards that Adriano has received, I would like to sort of give the words to him directly and uh, to introduce directly his talk, which is entitled Lessons Learned from Prion Diseases. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you, Perlis. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. And um, I hope that um, everything is now working. Uh, do you see my screen? And uh... Yes. Very good. So uh, I would like today to talk about uh, uh, how prion, prion toxicity comes about. And uh, for that, uh, I would like to introduce actually two concepts. and. Uh, and which I think can really be separated. And one is prion replication, and uh, we, and that is by now pretty well understood. We know that there is a normal prion protein that will misfold into something that we call the uh, PRP scrapey. So this is called PRPC, and then the whole thing oligomerizes and they make fibrils. All of this is pretty well understood, and by now even we have uh, a wealth of um, uh, high-resolution cryo EM structures that are coming up. Uh, on a weekly basis in the top journals. So I would say that this is on its best way to be understood in all its atomistic details. What is less understood is prion toxicity. So why is it that this stuff becomes toxic and kills neurons and eventually mm, produces a terrible uh, science and symptom of Chrysler Jacob disease? And that is not understood at all. In uh, other types of amyloidosis, like, uh, like for example, systemic amyloidosis, uh, uh, AA amyloid, uh, for uh, the, the spleen, the liver, they are full of amyloid. There is uh, like kilograms, truly kilograms of amyloid that uh, um, accrue in the 
in, in the organs uh, that are damaged by this amyloidosis. But in the case of prions, and also in the case of Alzheimer's, uh, the, the amount of amyloid is very small. It's uh, present in trace amounts. So this uh, implies that there may be some really, some very specific mechanisms of toxicity that uh, uh, create uh, this damage. So what is going on really? Well, I've been interested in this for more than 30 years now. And uh, the first uh, experiment that I did was done by Se Sebastian Brandon, my very first postdoc, uh, more than, well, it's really 30 years ago. And uh, and Sebastian did a, si a very simple experiment where he actually it tra um, transplanted, he used a PRP knockout mouse. So these mice cannot uh, develop prion disease because they don't have the normal prion protein, so they don't have the substrate uh, for this. But uh, he transplanted um, pieces of brains that expresses the prion protein into the brain of these mice, and then he infected them, and he saw that there is a prion disease, a spongiform encephalopathy that is developing in the grafted tissue, but not in the surroundings. So the, the, this already implied that for toxicity to occur, the receiving cell must express a normal prion protein. Now, that, is, that was interesting. And then we did something else. So we tried to counteract all of this uh, with antibodies. And uh, so the first thing we did uh, was uh, to express uh, antiprion antibodies in mice. Uh, and we actually showed, uh, and that was actually really the first time that uh, an antibody against a neurodegenerative protein uh, was shown uh, to uh, prevent disease. And, uh, and in, in fact, uh, these days, I mean, you have certainly heard yesterday of the very encouraging uh, results of the lecanemab trial. And so, so we did something similar with prions. And that again was more than 20 years ago and uh, and we showed that you can actually prevent the uh, prion pathogenesis in this way so this was super exciting and so some antibodies are clearly protective against prion disease but then we actually found that other antibodies are ultra toxic and this was the work of Tiziana Sonati PhD student at the time, uh, also more than 10 years ago, and she showed that an antibody, uh, the, the, for example, this antibody POM1, which, uh, by the way, was generated by my student Magda Polimenidu, who is now, and that's why it's called POM, and uh, Magda is now a very famous ALS researcher, and, uh, but when she was a PhD student in my lab, she showed, uh, Tiziana showed that her antibody would mm, would completely wipe out the granule cell layer of uh, cerebellar slices uh, that had been treated with, an with this antibody. So the antibody itself is super toxic. Uh, and why is that? Uh, well, my first idea was that maybe it is toxic because it denatures uh, the normal prion protein. And this is, uh, and therefore Michael James uh, has made a crystal structure of the prion protein that you see here, complex uh, with this, uh, with our toxic antibody. And uh, he here you see the contact uh, surface, uh, and uh, the result was very disappointing. It turns out that there is uh, no uh, denaturation of the normal prion protein. So actually nothing happens to it. So that um, kind of uh, threw us uh, a bit off, uh, off the rails. But then I talked to, uh, to um, uh, Luca Barani, and Luca Barani is a structural biologist, an NMR specialist in, at the Istituto di Ricerche Biomediche in Bellinzona. And uh, Luca is, uh, is very good at doing molecular dynamics. And he was telling me, you know, the structure of uh, oh, the crystal structure tells you only one snapshot of what goes on. And what you should actually do is to do molecular dynamics to see whether uh, whether perhaps uh, over time things happen in the presence of the antibody. And in fact, that's what Luca did. And he found that if you zoom in onto the prion protein, you see here there is an alpha helix, alpha 2 and alpha 3 helices. And they are far away because these two amino acids, these two residues, histidine and 140 and arginine 208, they are far apart. And therefore, this part here is pretty flexible. Now, when the antibody comes in and all that is here in green is the POM1 antibody, what you see that happens is that uh, there is a whole network of salt bridges and hydrogen bonds uh, that um, 
uh, takes place, and this is uh, the basis of the affinity of the antibody, but one thing that happens is that this arginine residue comes in close contact with the histidine. Now we are talking 2.6 angstrom, and this rigidifies this loop. And this was only seen by, uh, by molecular dynamics, and then it was Karl Fronzek, uh, who uh, has been a postdoc in my lab, and now he just received a professorship at uh, UCL and is moving to London in the next couple of months. And showed that um, indeed uh, when uh, when the POM1 antibody is bound uh, then the flexibility of the epitope re is reduced uh, whereas the flexibility of other parts of the uh, of the molecule of the prion protein are uh, um, is increased so this is the flexibility of the free protein and this is the flexibility of uh, the um, of, of the complex now the question was of course does this have anything to do with uh, um, with, with the toxicity well, for that, what Carl did was to, to take the toxic antibody and to do mutagenesis. So he mutagenized several residues in the heavy chain or in the light chain of the antibody. And indeed, essentially, every single residue that participates to epitope binding was mutagenized. And what he found is that uh, if you uh, try, if you mutagenize into alanine these residues, uh, then you often uh, um, lose uh, uh, affinity. And this is essentially affinity measured by two different methods, by FRET and by surface plasma resonance. Uh, and you see that most of these uh, uh, mutants actually have a lower affinity, but some of them actually still have a strong affinity. Look, for example, at this mutagenesis of uh, tyrosine 104 into alanine. Uh, this antibody is still binding very strongly. And uh, so we wanted to see what happens. So now you have to understand that uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the this structure, which we call the hydrogen latch, because it latches, it's a hydrogen bond that latches uh, this loop of prion protein and makes this uh, stable. So the, um, uh, this structure exists also in the free um, prion protein, but uh, the time spent uh, in the H latch conformation of the, pre of the prion protein is very low, it's le less than 20%. If you put in POM1, now most of the time the prion protein is spent into the latched conformation. Now, if you mutagenize uh, um, tyrosine 104, you see that the H latch conformation is essentially completely abolished. So what happens to um, toxicity? Toxicity is gone. So what you see here is uh, that uh, uh, these are again uh, brain slices, uh, and you see here the nice uh, cerebellar granule layer. You give the POM1 antibody, everything is destroyed. But if you give the mutant, nothing is destroyed. Now that is one thing. But actually, the super exciting thing is that uh, not only is this um, mutant uh, 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 that does not induce a hydrogen latch uh, um, non-toxic, but it protects against prions. And what you see here is that uh, again uh, slices uh, you infect them with prions RML means Rocky Mountain Laboratory prions uh, and what you see is that uh, in the presence of the mutagenized antibody now the prions are no longer toxic now for me this is super exciting because what it means uh, is that probably what the antibody is doing is that it's uh, docking to the same place where the pathogenic prions would dock and preventing it from exerting toxicity. So super exciting. Now, how to prove this? Well, one idea was, okay, if all of this is true, let's try to mimic the, the rigidification of this part of the loop. And the way this was done was by actually mutagenizing here, putting two cysteines at the neck of the loop. And the two cysteines would make a disulfide bridge, which would that then um, uh, rigidify the loop. And, uh, and then the question is what happens? So this was done. Then we made uh, adeno-associated viruses, which we translate, transduced uh, in, again into these uh, into these slices and they are super toxic. The transduced cells are killed within 31 days. So again, rigidifying the loop suffices to create the toxicity. Now, this is very uh, exciting because it essentially points uh, to a fundamental mechanism of prion toxicity. Now, um, uh, because uh, the, uh, the two conformations of the normal prion protein appear to, uh, to be uh, in an equilibrium, we thought, okay, can we actually modify the equilibrium with antibodies? So what we did, was uh, to scan a library of fa a phage display library to discover phages that would preferentially bind to 
to the free prion protein but would not bind to the mutant with the two cysteines. And the idea was that such antibodies may be able to shift the equilibrium away from the latched conformation. So we found such antibodies. We also found antibodies that are not differentially binding. Now, these antibodies can do not protect against prions. You see that the slides are destroyed. But the antibodies that preferentially bind to the non-latched conformation Formation, well, it turns out that these binds, uh, these antibodies are protective against uh, against prions. So again, the plot is thickening. And finally, uh, okay, we'll skip this. And um, but finally, we thought, okay, oh, now can we actually do a therapy with this? And for that, uh, um, uh, Matt Holt, our collaborators at the VIB in Leuven, has made an adeno-associated virus that transduces uh, the uh, the Y one o four A mutant antibody. And this antibody is innocuous in vivo, but now if you infect mice with prions and you administer the uh, adeno-associated virus, now each one of these mice will express a different amount of, uh, of, uh, of protective antibody in their brain, because obviously you cannot control how, much, how effective in an individual mouse, um, how effective the transduction of the antibody will be. But what you find is that the more antibodies the mice express, the longer they live, which again points uh, to this being um, uh, really a um, uh, um, a, a way of um, of transducing um, uh, of transducing toxicity. Now I want to spend a couple of words about uh, the normal function of the prion protein, and uh, all I want to say is that it turns out the and this is a team that is becoming more and more obvious. The amino terminus of the prion protein interacts with a bunch of G protein couple receptors, and uh, we have discovered a couple of years ago that uh, the prion protein is an agonistic ligand of um, of a receptor that uh, was was usually called GPR-126, uh, now the, uh, uh, the geniuses of the, number of the nomenclature committee have completely changed the nomenclature, so now nobody understands anymore what this means, but uh, you know, it used to be called GPR-126. And, uh, uh, but uh, in the meantime, we have also seen that uh, uh, the normal prion protein interacts with uh, MGLUR1 and MGLUR5, these are metabotropic glutamate receptors, and they also trans uh, transduce toxicity, and, um, and uh, Perhaps the most exciting finding, is still unpublished by Ashwin Lacaraggio, is uh, that uh, there is yet another adhesion GPCR called GPR133, and uh, that is uh, negatively regulated by the prion protein, which I think is really exciting. So if you, if you transduce GPR133 into hex cells, uh, you get a spike in cyclic AMP. So GPR133 is uh, uh, constitutively active. Uh, However, if you add, oops, sorry, if you add the prion protein, uh, what happens uh, is that uh, now you reduce the activity, and it turns out that uh, uh, if you comp so we made GPR one to three knockout mice, and again these mice are at least partially protected against prion toxicity. So we believe that uh, GPR one to three, which is expressed in the brain, uh, may be a candidate uh, for uh, the transduction of prion toxicity. Now. I want to say something about vacuolation. Now, prion diseases are extremely, um, what shall I say, characteristic because the vacuolation is such a prominent feature. And I have been thinking for three decades that this is telling us something. It's, uh, you know, vacuolation is so impressive in uh, Chrysal Diacob disease, in Scrapey, that, uh, you know, it's almost impossible to believe that it would have no. Uh, uh, relevance uh, to toxicity. So wh why do we have this? Uh, well, it turns out vacuolation has been known for many years, and in fact, in the very first uh, um, description uh, of Chrysal Diacob disease, more than 100 years ago, it, uh, the vacuoles were already recognized. And, uh, and these vacuoles are inside the neurons. And you see here, this is a neuronal uh, process, a myelinated neuronal process, and you see here a vacuole that has coming up inside the process. So uh, Aswin Lacaraggio asked the question, what are the mechanisms responsible for the generation of vacuoles? And what if, um, uh, his hypothesis was that uh, this may have something to do with the metabolism of phosphoinositol 3-phosphate. And there is, a uh, there is a kinase called PIK5, which, uh, which um, phosphorylates uh, phosphoinositol 3-phosphate into phosphoinositol 3,5 diphosphate. And this controls uh, 
the size of endosomes. Uh, and in fact, you can see here in, the, in a PIK5 knockdown, uh, these are all endosomes and uh, uh, lysosomes. And what you see is that uh, the, um, uh, the knockdown of uh, PIK5 uh, creates something the equivalent of spongiosis, a vacuolation, an enlargement of, uh, uh, of endosomes. So the experiments that um, Ashwin has done, which I think and I, I really think is important, is uh, was to uh, give prions to mice. So these are controlled mice we infect with non-infectious brain homogenates, so control. This is another control. This is a mice infected with uh, prions, another mouse infected with prions. Here we are looking at PIK5 and the result is amazing. You uh, infect with prions and PIK5 disappears from the brain of these mice. PIK5 exists in a ternary complex with two other proteins, PIK4 and VAC14, and there nothing changes. So this change is very specific to, um, uh, to pick five. And the same thing happens in patients, in human patients with Crasel Jacob disease. There again, uh, the infection with prion wipes away uh, the expression of pick five. Uh, they also, and this I think is very satisfactory for me, if you give POM1, the toxic antibody, to, um, to brain slices, uh, what you see is again the same thing. The toxic antibody reduces PIK5, but not PIK4 and not VAC14, and this is the quantitation. So, which also again indicates that POM1 is what I call a prion mimetic. It's an antibody that does the same thing that uh, prion infection does. And uh, I won't go into all this, but let me just tell you that. That, uh, it uh, Aswin has discovered that PIK5 is, is uh, palmitoylated, is acylated by an, uh, one of these enzymes. There are uh, 23 such enzymes are called DHHCs. These are the uh, palmitoyl transferases, the acyl transferases. And, uh, and then he knocked down every single uh, um, uh, acyl transferase in the human genome, and they actually found there are two which are responsible for, um, uh, for um, acylating PIK5. And it turns out that if you knock down both of them, then PIK5 becomes completely deacylated, and again you get vacuoles. And, um, and then essentially um, it turns out that this is really the mechanism that deacylation of PIK5 during uh, prion infection is really what creates the vacuoles. And finally, uh, we generated um, through a chemical company, we generated a soluble analog of uh, phosphonosol 3 5 diphosphate and administer it to uh, brain slices infected with prions and what we, what this happens is that uh, here we look at the number of vacuolated cells, uh, control cells are very little vacuoles, infected cells are plenty of vacuoles, but if you give the phosphonosetol 3,5 diphosphate uh, then you can suppress actually the vacuolation. Right, so um, uh, there, uh, I think that I have another couple of minutes uh, to go and uh, I would like to uh, switch gears completely and uh, tell you something uh, very different and, um, and, uh, and that is uh, really what I want to talk about uh, for just a couple of minutes and uh, essentially um, what I'm, um, what I've become fascinated with uh, is um, uh, genome-wide hypothesis-free experiments. And uh, the reason is uh, that uh, if you look at uh, the multiplication of prion infectivity in vitro, it, it can be done, but you know, it's very efficient. It requires very harsh conditions. You need to sonicate or shake or denature your materials. But if you give prions to cells or to organoids, they will replicate prion infectivity very effectively. Now, this suggests the existence of something that I call a prion replicase. And I should say that uh, this prion replicase at the moment exists only in my mind, there is absolutely no evidence uh, that it exists or whatever it is. So then the question is, how do you discover it? And, uh, and there I go back to Popperian philosophy, uh, which says that you cannot, uh, this is very interesting, you cannot know more than is actually known, because, uh, uh, because if you are out to discover something fundamentally diff uh, new, you cannot rely, you know, it won't be in the literature. So how do you go about it? Well, the, my answer is you go about it uh, by performing unbiased genome-wide foragenetic screens. Uh, 
And uh, the first thing that we did in order to enable this uh, was to create a low biohazard human cell line. And the reason is that, uh, you know, prions are dangerous. Uh, prions are dangerous and uh, there have been uh, horrible incidents and uh, I don't want to expose myself or my um, uh, co-workers uh, to the danger of prions. And therefore, the first thing that we did was to take a human cell line, remove the prion gene and substitute it with an ovine gene. And this cell are called hops, so human ovine, ovinized human cells, and then because ovine prions are most likely uninfectious to humans, and there is a lot of evidence for that, and they won't go into the detail. So first thing we made is this cell line, with which now we can actually do a lot of experiments without worrying too much about biosafety, and. Uh, and the first thing we did was an array, uh, uh, well, I should say that uh, uh, the way people to do um, CRISPR screens these days is usually, usually as pooled screens. But, you know, pooled screens, you cannot do a lot of pooled screens because, uh, um, because uh, for prions, because, uh, because you can select the cells. The, the, uh, for a pooled screen, you always need a selection marker, but, uh, but uh, prion replication is nothing that you can select for. So you have to array screens in which uh, you look one by one at, uh, the, at the genes of interest and that was done a couple of years ago the experiment well this was just published but uh, actually the experiments started four years ago and uh, the, uh, at that time we did it with um, sRNAs and that was already very revealing because it uh, revealed that actually there is a, a RNA binding protein that is rate limiting for prion propagation and uh, again I won't go into the details um, the paper has just come out uh, but um, but uh, I want to talk uh, about uh, array libraries. So, as I said, the pool libraries are good for lethality screens, but if you want to do biochemical, morphological, or cell, non cell autonomous phenotypes, you can't do it with pool libraries. So, you have to actually do array libraries. Now, there are no um, efficient uh, array CRISPR libraries with where, which uh, this could be done, and therefore we made our own. And this was the work mostly of Janan In uh, with a lot of co workers. Uh, and he actually devised a vector that contains four guide RNAs, four guide all uh, non-overlapping against the same gene, and then Janan invented a way to make these vectors very, very fast. And uh, these vectors are called Tispiezzo and Tigonfio, so the Tispiezzo library, uh, essentially, um, uh, it means I break you in two, so it's, uh, yeah, so it's a CRISPR uh, knockout library, and the Tigonfio library is actually a CRISPR activator library, where the guide RNAs are uh, directed against uh, the promoter region of the gene. And this, uh, this library have descri have described on a biochive paper and uh, you can photograph uh, the QR code and uh, you will see the paper. So um, it turns out that this strategy is incredibly effective. So if you actually put four guys into a vector, the, ac the, uh, the activation, uh, the activation uh, efficiency goes up uh, tremendously, really skyrockets. Uh, and uh, this is for three randomly chosen genes. And the same thing happens to the knockout. Uh, also, the knockout uh, efficiency goes up from 20% to more than 80%, and sometimes even more than 90%. So in the meantime, all these libraries have been made. We have have uh, uh, sub-libraries for each one of the major groups of um, protein coding gene of the human genome. Altogether, we have made more than 41,000 uh, um, uh, individual plasmids. Uh, and uh, I will skip all of this just to say that we have all quality control. We know that uh, these libraries work very well. And why we were doing all this, uh, the paper of uh, Jonathan Weisman uh, came out uh, showing that you can actually uh, do, you can use a methyl transferase uh, fused to Cas9, uh, to dead Cas9, in order to methylate the promoter of genes, uh, and this actually switches off the genes. And this was, uh, so our Tigonfio library actually uh, is um, uh, targets the promoter region of the genes, and this is uh, uh, the position of our guides re relative to the transcriptional star site, and, uh, and uh, this 
this is the window in which uh, uh, the, the the methylation of the um, of the gene would work against transcription. So we thought, okay, maybe Tigonview will also work for uh, uh, for uh, heritable. Uh, 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 silencing of genes, uh, and this works wonderfully. And I can tell you here, this is a, a CD151 uh, uh, expression with a non-targeting vector. And if you use the Tigonfio library, you can actually uh, in, uh, silence uh, almost 90% of um, of the cells uh, um, expressing CD151. So this works very well, and th this makes uh, obviously things now very effective and very um, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, very flexible and uh, therefore we have used now uh, this library um, uh, to to test a bunch of phenotype i'm just uh, showing you here that uh, we have been looking at uh, um, genes that uh, influence the activity of uh, glucocerebrosides, which is uh, uh, the strongest risk factor for um, uh, sporadic Parkinson's disease. And this was very, very well. We have a huge separation between um, positive and negative controls. And uh, now we have run a limited array screens, CRISPR activation array screen uh, to identify uh, genes that uh, will um, uh, have an impact on the expression of glucocerebrosides and this is already the results and we have found some of these genes actually were expected other completely unexpected we even find a transcription factor which if activated will reduce the expression of GBA which is super exciting and now this uh, um, uh, this screen is being expanded to the whole genome and we are currently progressing at a pace of approximately 2,000 genes per week so we will soon have the entire landscape of all the uh, uh, genes of the human genome that have an impact on uh, um, on expression of uh, GBA. Now, I just want to say that uh, the libraries uh, were made for us uh, uh, to do uh, our own research, but I really, really, really want uh, um, to make them available to all of scientists. I think that uh, the number of questions that you can ask uh, with this type of approach is essentially unlimited. I think it's particularly useful for neurodegenerative research because there, are, uh, in most cases, you cannot actually select for uh, uh, um, for phenotypes and uh, so if you are interested in this and so please talk to me because uh, we are really keen to collaborate and to disseminate this library and to find ways to, um, uh, to uh, for, for people to use them I think that uh, in a way this is going to be uh, probably the last uh, um, uh, of my large projects uh, in, uh, in my professional career and uh, in a way I see it as some kind of legacy for me Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Adriano. Very exciting as usual, and uh, and I I really uh, impressed by this uh, this data on the on the that you show with the antibody, the, the toxicity, and so on. So perhaps I can start by asking you a question. Of course, given the fact that you modify the flexibility of that portion of the arm of the constitutive prion protein. And, uh, and of course, all the experiments you're doing to try to find partners, which may actually explain the effect. So what is basically the physiological role of the prion protein? Is it actually something which uh, enables other receptors to be in place or uh, some other binding proteins to be in place? Because the flexibility would imply that you need some degree of uh, function probably on the outer component of the protein to be able to arrange the other proteins in the membrane. So what is uh, uh, becoming very clear is, uh, well, I should say that uh, in terms of molecular mechanism uh, uh, for the no function of the normal prion protein, uh, I would say that uh, the only validated uh, pathway, molecular pathway, is that of GPR 126. And uh, there is uh, what has become very clear is that, uh, one, uh, that uh, the PRP, axonal PRP, interacts uh, with 126, uh, which is a GPCR on the surface of Schwann cells. Uh, and uh, this is crucial to the preservation of the axomyelinic integrity. And in fact, PRP knockout mice uh, have a slowly progressive demyelinating disease in the 
peripheral nervous system. So I would say at the moment, uh, that is the only function that we know of the prion protein, but it's very strongly validated. There is no doubt about this. Uh, and, uh, uh, the, and then the question is, does PRP do anything in the brain or um, in addition to the peripheral nervous system? And they have some strong suspicions, uh, and uh, but at the moment, uh, they are, uh, I would say, too speculative uh, that I would be able to talk about, uh, not because there is anything uh, uh, secret about it, just because I may be wrong. Okay, there is a, a question from Stefan Lichtenthaler, and uh, he asks, how does uh, the prion replication gene mechanistically contribute to prion replication? Sorry, I, 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 so I repeat that. How, how does the prion replication gene, ah, the one that you define, right. Uh, 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 got it, uh, got it, Stefan. So I, uh, so in my, uh, um, again, in my fantasy, I uh, suspect that something might exist uh, that is similar to uh, Hishok protein 104 of yeast, uh, that is uh, some kind of disaggregates, uh, something that takes uh, a big aggregate of prions and chops it down in smaller aggregates, each one of which will be a replicative unit. So I think at the moment, uh, this is what I would put my money on, but I don't know. So I think that the experiment will tell us. Okay, we have another question. Uh, uh, do your mutant POM1 antibodies uh, not only inhibit toxicity, but also PRP spread replication? Very good question. Uh, they do, but very mildly. So it's mostly about toxicity, but they also do impair somewhat uh, prion replication. Very good. I have no other questions at the moment on the chat. Uh, I would like again to thank Adriano for this wonderful presentation, very exciting. I would like to stress also what he has said before. I think the work with the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, lines has been amazing, and uh, we have already benefited from this in a collaboration with Peter Hoyting in Tübingen, and I think this is a tremendous resource which should be somewhat, uh, I would uh, hope, centrally financed by by, uh, you know, to be able to make it available to the widest community. And we have been looking into that. Uh, I think that would be a great opportunity for all the field of neuroscience, not only neurodegenerative diseases, to be able to understand more mechanisms by using this kind of approach. So, Adriano, thank you once again very, very much and uh, all the best. And then we move to the next speaker, who is uh, uh, Professor Michel Henniker. Uh, Michael is uh, uh, currently the director of the Luxembourg Center for System Biomedicine. Uh, he's a neurologist and a clinician scientist who has made uh, outstanding breakthrough contribution in, um, in uh, the uh, understanding of the role of neuroimmune interaction. So how the brain and the systemic immune system may favor the uh, onset of neurodegenerative diseases. Um, he has been a colleague of ours at the ZNE for many, many years, and we still are in, in very close collaboration. And uh, after basically being at the University of Bonn as director of the memory clinic, he moved then uh, to take over this position very recently in Luxembourg. And um, uh, we still have a, a close interaction of a number of, uh, of uh, projects that uh, have been carried out both here in Bonn and now in, in his new institute. Um, I would like, without again any further ado, leave the word to, to Michael, Michael, and uh, he will tell us about sterile inflammation in neurodegenerative disease. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Pialigi, many thanks for having me and for this kind of introduction. Um, yes, I will uh, want to discuss with you um, during this presentation and uh, in the Q&A whether or not um, inflammatory signals contribute to the initiation and progression of neurodegenerative disease. And if we speak about sterile inflammation, it's uh, mainly carried out by uh, our innate immune system. And living through a pandemic, we all know that we are constantly exposed to bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And to give you a small idea what our innate immune system does for us, watch that movie, uh, Neutrophil, an innate immune cell, which uh, hunts for Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and you can see that the cell has to take a lot of clever decisions. It's equipped with pattern recognition receptors. 
that allows him to follow up the uh, bacteria and ultimately to take it up, um, ingest it and destroy it. And this, this is something which happens constantly in our body. And without that function, we wouldn't make a day and die from infection. So the innate immune system is our first line of defense. These six, uh, cells uh, do exist not only in our bloodstream, but also as resident innate immune cells in the brain. We call them microglia in the lung. We call them alveolar macrophages, copper cells in the liver mesangium cells in the kidney, beneath cells in the gut, and of course, bone marrow macrophages. They all protect these organs from infection, but they contribute as well to their structure and to their function. And if you want to learn more about microglia and especially about the history of um, their uh, uh, identification by Pio del Rio Ortega. I want to point you to this uh, very elegant review by Amanda Sierra published on the history of the discovery in Glia in 2016. Now, when Alzheimer's disease unfolds, we believe that there is a sequential um, um, cleavage of uh, the amyloid precursor protein yielding amyloid beta monomers, which uh, should leave our brain either by export to the cerebrospinal fluid by 25% approximately, the same amount where the glylymphatic uh, pathway. The remaining uh, amyloid beta is locally degraded by microglia cells, um, mainly by secretion of IDE, but also by other mechanisms and uh, most likely through phagocytosis as well. If this system gets out of balance. Amyloid beta forms oligomeric structures, which can be visualized in blood-like systems. And you see here the molecular shift to a higher molecular weight. And ultimately, it, there is fibril formation, which then leads to the deposition of amyloid beta um, in the parenchyma of the brain. This deposition starts an inflammatory reaction, which is characterized by the uh, microglial activation seen on the left side and GFAP positive astrocyte uh, reaction on the right side. And ultimately, the disease is characterized by tau neurofibril formation within neurons. Now, this is showing you a cortical section of an Alzheimer patient, which is stained for with Congo red for amyloid beta and Congo red actually intercalates uh, with beta sheet structured amyloids. Now, long before Congo red has been developed um, as a stain for human brains by neuropathologists, it has been developed for something completely different and uh, in uh, and licensed as a bacterial stain by Paul Bertiger in 1874. Now, the question arises. Uh, what's the commonality between a bacterial surface and a human brain? And that uh, was identified by Matthew Chapman and colleagues showing that uh, various bacteria, including Salmonella typhimurium, Staph aureus, and Escherichia coli, carry beta sheet structured amyloids uh, by nature on their surface. But that means that uh, a myelid cell here has, um, has learned over a million of years by evolution um, and equipped with certain receptor systems that a beta sheet structured amyloid is nothing else than a pathogen signal. And ligation of these pattern recognition receptors, including the toll-like receptors, the scavenging receptors, CD47 and CD36, just to name some, yeah, uh, starts two major reactions, uh, inflammatory reaction, which uh, results in the release of complement factors, cytokines, chemokines, and other immune signals. At the same time, our microglia cells stop to do a lot of sensible things for our brain. They reduce synaptic scaling and pruning. They uh, reduce the generation of neurotrophic factors, including BDNF. And they also are much uh, uh, less effective in depressed clearance from the brain. Now, amyloid beta is not the only um, danger associated molecular pattern which arises in the brain during your de degeneration. And for example, you will find elevated chromogranin A in Alzheimer patient brains and LBD in frontotemporal dementia and Parkinson's disease. And chromogranin A is as effective in stimulating microglia cells as compared to a bacterial cell wall component. 
Now, if you look at other components such as S100 pro, uh, proteins, in particular MRP14, you'll see that the presence of MRP14 uh, in an APPPS1 mouse brain doubles the uh, generation of TNF alpha and interferon gamma at the same time, knocking down that single danger associate molecular pattern molecule is uh, lifting the pressure and enabling the cells to phagocyte much better um, uh, amyloid beta and degrade it as compared to the control situation. Now that means that these danger associated molecular pattern impair massively on the function of microglia cells. In general, inflammation can have structural and functional consequences for our brain. On a functional side, we know that cytokines alone or in concert can suppress hippocampal long-term potentiation, an important factor for information storage and consolidation. There's a strong synergism with excitotoxic stimuli in the brain that leads to the killing of hippocampal neurons, loss of synapses, axons, and dendrites. More recently, so Yun Hong has identified a mechanism by which microglia can take up synapses in excess under AD-like conditions in respective mouse models. They engulf those in a complement three dependent uh, manner. And Jonas Nea and Guy Brown have identified a mechanism by which microglia can take up even living neurons if those do not present, do not eat me signals on their surface. Now, this all comes on the background um, uh, of our genome and uh, Chivas associated uh, Chivas studies over the past decade have identified more and more uh, risk variants, of which many are uh, important for innate immune signaling pathways, uh, TREM2, CDK33, APCA7, BIN1, um, and so on, just to mention some of them. But the genetic background is not the only factor which would influence an uh, innate immune reaction in the brain. There are uh, a lot of factors which uh, we inflict ourselves, like uh, during uh, our life, for example, midlife obesity, wrong nutrition increases uh, cytokine levels in our circulation and there is a strong risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease in later life, poor oral health, periodontitis, aging by generation of a senescence associated secretory profile, which is characterized by many cytokines, brain trauma, systemic inflammation, uh, which are all critical factors that uh, enhance the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's uh, disease in later life and ultimately reduce physical activity um, is another factor which leads to elevated cytokine levels and stimulation of neuroinflammation in the brain. Now, uh, more recently, uh, Koso and colleagues uh, in the last month have uh, uh, published a very nice integrated fine mapping analysis of gene regulation across neurons and microglia cells and have uh, combined attack sequencing, um, transcription factor footprinting, and, and Chivas analysis, showing that in particular in Alzheimer's disease, all the Chivas uh, risk variants actually function through uh, microglia and not through uh, neuronal cells. In ALS, you see uh, the opposite effect. The, there, the uh, function of risk variants is more in uh, neurons as compared to the microglia cell compartment. And in Parkinson's, it's uh, almost restricted to um, uh, neuronal um, risk variants. Now, looking back to Alzheimer's, uh, what this study ultimately says is that the microglia cells and the microglia regulome is the driving factor of disease pathogenesis. Now, when we look at the available data, most of it uh, comes from uh, studies in vitro or in animal models. So it's very important to ensure that the pathogenic traits and pathways we're interested in are actually uh, also um, uh, present in, in human microglia. And this is work from Eric Bodeke and his group comparing uh, four different transcriptomic data sets and uh, defining a core human microglia signature. And within the core of the core signature, you will find the inflammasomes and their respective products. So the most abundant uh, inflammasome in microglia cells is the NALP3 inflammasome, which is a uh, 
canonical pathway for innate immune initiation um, in human cells and in murine cells. Um, in this case, ligation of the toll-like receptor or cytokine receptors uh, initiates a transcriptional activation, which uh, results in the formation of proforms of cytokines, hemokines, and autoinhibited NALP3. There's a post-transcriptional activation uh, which runs through various steps of licensing the buildup of the active NALP inflammasome and the maturation to an ASC spec. And the ASC spec then has the active caspase, which cleaves gastroamine D, pro L18, and L1 beta. The gastroamine D pore is being formed by one of the cleavage products that allows for the uh, coordinated release of uh, the active cytokines then. So this system is active in Alzheimer patients as uh, shown uh, by us some years ago, you will find cleaved caspase one as now inflammasome activity signal. And if we blot this in uh, H-match non-demented controls versus ADKs, I hope you can see that there's a strong regulation of this system of NAP3 inflammasome activation in the AD patient brains. Luckily, this is completely um, reflected in mouse models. In this case, in the APPPS1 Delta E9 mouse, you can see that in an H-dependent manner, this is uh, going up. And if we knock down NALP3 in APPPS1 transgenic mice, we completely block caspase cleavage and the occurrence of interleukin-1 beta and um, elevation in uh, the mouse brain. Now, these... Uh, uh, is the situation in these mouse models, we have the amyloid uh, beta deposits being attacked and taken care of by microglia cells. Obviously, this is not efficacious uh, enough. So um, in the situation where we can knock out the NALP3 uh, gene on this background, we see that we can double the effectiveness of microglial phagocytosis and degradation over time. And this results in a strong reduction in very old 18 month old APPPS1 transgenic mice in the hippocampus as shown here, as well as in all other brain regions. Now, um, most importantly, uh, beyond the pure uh, protection from amyloid beta deposition, there's protection from spine loss by knocking down the NAB inflammasome or caspase 1, as evidenced by Martin Colt in a collaboration. And Martin was also show, uh, able to show that hypocampal uh, LTP measured here at the Sheffield collaterals, uh, which is suppressed in the APPPS1 transgenic mouse in comparison to wild type animals, was completely protected by knocking down NAB 3. And this protection from, of synaptic plasticity uh, resulted in an almost completely protected um, spatial navigation, uh, learning, and memory uh, phenotype. You can see here in the Morris Water Maze test over eight year, uh, days, the uh, uh, NALP knockout APPPS1 mice learn almost as good as wild type or NALP uh, knockout control background animals. In comparison, the APPPS1 transgenic mouse model has a hard time to uh, learn um, any, um, anything in this test. At day nine, we uh, take out the platform and uh, ask the animals uh, whether they have actually used a spatial navigation strategy. And you can see here that APPPS1 mice differ from all the other three groups uh, massively. These mice do not remember where the platform had been over the pe uh, previous eight days, while the NAP knockout is completely protected. Now, uh, we asked ourselves what would be the fate of these immune cells that undergo inflammasome activation and whether they would die from a pyroptotic cell death releasing the ASCs back. And uh, in fact, this is the case. We can find ASCs backs in the human as well as in the, as in the mouse brain model in within microglia cells as shown before, but also in the exocellular space. And we developed the model to actually induce microglial pyroptosis by exposing these cells to LPS um, um, for three hours and subsequently to ATP or nigerisin for one hour. 
And you can see that we can visualize these uh, aspects in the supernatant of these cells and can also quantify them by fact sorting. We then uh, uh, wanted to show that amyloid beta exposure is a great uh, inducer of microglial paraptosis. And during these investigations, we failed a couple of uh, times until we actually used a Tamra labeled amyloid beta, which allowed us to uh, see that once the amyloid uh, beta exposure uh, would induce paraptosis, the aspect which is being released would rapidly bind to uh, the amyloid beta as shown here. And you can see the yellow dot, which is the aspect and the Tamra labeled amyloid beta surrounding it in a hollow like structure. On an electron microscopy level, we also found that the aspect would act like a magnet to the amyloid beta peptides, which has, um, resulted in the hypothesis that once the microglia would undergo a paraptosis and would release such an aspect, the interaction with amyloid um, monomers and oligomers would probably be the seeding moment for the amyloid beta deposit. Now, to start these, uh, we uh, looked at tioflavin T uh, uh, co seeding and uh, a co seeding assay, which monitors the conversion of a monomer to the aggregate. And uh, you can see in green the aggregation tendency in the absence of amyloid beta. And hopefully, you uh, recognize the shift to the left. Uh, uh, so, adding in S specs dramatically changes. Uh, the propensity to aggregate here, which is a classical cross-seeding sign. On a blood-like system, we could show that uh, in the absence of ASC, amyloid beta 1 to 40 uh, hardly uh, aggregates and forms uh, fibrils or oligomers, and increasing concentrations of ASC uh, completely changes uh, that. It's the same for amyloid beta 1 to 42, as shown here. So again, uh, A beta fibril formation and A beta oligomer formation is strongly influenced by the addition of ASC specs. Looking at a confirmatory co-sedimentation assay in collaboration with Jochen Walter and Satish Kumar, we found that in that experiment, which distinguishes amyloid beta in alone or in addition to ASC, um, we find everything in the supernatant at time point zero, while at time point six hours, everything has been converted to a pellet. So this is kind of forming an artificial plaque deposit that um, prompted experiments where we look to the mouse model again, finding by co-immunoprecipitation that amyloid beta would bind strongly to ASC. Now, immunohistochemically, we were able to show that in the rodent mouse model, the core of the amyloid beta plaque, which actually made of ASC, and you can see that the 6E10 positive amyloid beta forms a hollow surrounding that core. So that um, stimulated the idea that actually, again, uh, amyloid uh, beta would be seeded by by ASC, and um, we employed a model introduced by Matthias Yuka and Larry Walker, and nicely described in Nature 2013 in a review article where injection of APPPS1 or, uh, or Alzheimer patient brain lysates would uh, result in uh, spreading of pathology. Now, this model has a problem because synthetic amyloid beta is not seeding, suggesting that either the amyloid beta is different or there are endogenous cofactors which are required to induce spread of pathology. Now, um, and in first attempt, we injected uh, APPPS1 brain material compared to wild type in opposing hypocampi, and we found what Matthias Jucker has nicely described in a science paper in 2008 already, the twofold increase of uh, amyloid uh, beta deposition uh, in the injected, in the, in the brain hemisphere that had received the APPPS1 uh, lysate. And you also see that uh, at, at the A-beta oligomers are massively increased and total A-beta increased. The system is not uh, uh, influenced by uh, the wild-type brain lysate because non-injected mice show the same degree of deposition and uh, A-beta oligomer uh, formation. Importantly, APP processing pathways are not involved. And then we repeat the entire experiment on the ASC knockout level. So we only take one, this single inflammatory molecule, and the total effect is gone, especially, um, uh, and most importantly to me, there is no formation of fibrils and A-beta oligomers as previously found in the pure test tube experiment. 
Now, uh, we didn't trust that experiment so much um, because it used uh, this injection model. So we generated a mouse model, uh, which we analyze on this uh, two photon LSM treadmill system. Um, you see that this mouse is an APPPS1 transgenic mouse carrying a 63CR1 EGFP and a knock in ask M cherry. So um, we can visualize the microglia cells in green and all the ASC specs in red. And we inject these mice metoxy XO4 uh, to visualize the amyloid beta deposits. And so we see that microglia cells over time undergo pyroptosis as predicted. And uh, I again want to remind you, this is in the living mouse brain and there is release of ASC specs uh, widespreadly. And then we take the green filter out and you will see in the subsequent uh, uh, movie that there is no amyloid beta deposit, which does not have a red ASC core. And these are just mice which live a, a, a happy mouse life. They do not have uh, any injection. And it becomes clear that in the mouse model we look at, amyloid beta deposition uh, has as initiating moment the uh, microglial paraptosis and release of ASC specs. Otherwise, they could, these uh, ASC specs would not reside in the core of these plaque deposits. Now, what about humans? Uh, another uh, co immunoprecipitation experiment confirmed that in human brain, in the case of Alzheimer cases, amyloid beta would bind to ASC very strongly. And then Marcos Kummer in the lab performed an experiment where he's uh, blitted the fluffy fiber compartment from the core of the amyloid beta the plaque. And interestingly, in MCI cases, so 10 years prior to full dementia, um, we found ASC already in the core together with amyloid beta. The only difference of the AD cases was that we had more amyloid beta in the surrounding fiber compartment. And so it was no, it was no surprise then when we looked to the uh, human amyloid beta deposit, we, we again found that there's a core of ASC surrounded by amyloid beta. Now, this is not a completely new finding. And here in this uh, immunohistochemical uh, staining for ASC and IBA1, which we call microglia cemetery because there's hardly any happy microglia cell visualized. You see a lot of microglia corpses and released ASC specs. This is from a frontal cortex of an Alzheimer patient. But looking at um, a painting from Alois Alzheimer, Franz Nissel, back in 1911, you may uh, really see in the lowest uh, lane that they have already depicted this microglia suffering. And I think they were aware of the role of the microglia cell compartment in this disease. Now, the ultimate question we had was whether there is a connection from the early amyloid beta deposition to the tau for, uh, neurofibrillary tangle formation in the neuron and whether innate immunity would be a contributing factor. So we employed another model introduced by Jürgen Gutz in a science paper 201, uh, where we did a similar injection paradigm using tau uh, transgenic animals, in this case, tau 22 mice. And to make a long story short, uh, we found that indeed, um, as pre-described, uh, injection of IPP uh, PS1 brain material into hippocampi would induce uh, tau pathology while uh, doing the very same experiment on an ALP3 or ASC knockout background would completely abolish. This is the quantification in red, the tau 22 mice in green and blue the knockout of ASC or NALP3, and you can clearly see that uh, there is no uh, um, elevation or potentiation of uh, tau pathology once the NALP3 inflammasome pathway has been knocked down. To summarize that paper, which I cannot allude to for time reasons, we hypothesized that microglia cells undergoing activation and releasing R1 beta um, stimulate tau pathology um, over, uh, via the interleukin-1 receptor and hippocampal neurons, as shown in this work, uh, through a mighty 88 mac one 2 chemokinase to alpha pathway, leading to uh, the formation of paired helical filaments and ultimately neurofibrils. So we are uh, out to uh, um, start a clinical trial with a blood band barrier penetrant NALP3 inhibitor in uh, collaboration with Novartis, uh, hopefully soon. And we also work on target biomarkers together with cell signaling, especially focusing on cleaved gastromin uh, D.
And uh, with this, I want to sum up. Uh, I hope I could con uh, convince you that the innate immune system is actively contributing to neurodegeneration, to its phenotype, as well as to the initiation of the disease. The NAP inflammasome is strongly activated in Alzheimer's disease in respective mouse models. And uh, this pathway, importantly, is highly conserved between both species. Uh, inflammasome activation accounts for a reduction of a beta phagocytosis. It induces seeding and spreading of pathology through ASC-SPEC uh, release. And it also has a role for tau pathology as a beta induced tau pathology strongly depends on uh, the interleukin-1 beta released uh, in response to it. NAP3 inhibitors are in clinical phase three studies for various peripheral diseases, including inflammatory bowel disease, and show a high safety profile. And therefore, I believe that new blood band barrier penetrant NAP inhibitors have been uh, developed and, and need to enter clinical trials in AD and Parkinson's disease. And with this, I thank all the people in my uh, previous group in Bonn and our great collaborators. Uh, around the globe and especially the funding associations, including the DZNE, which uh, was the main site uh, where this work has been conducted. And thank you for your attention and hope you have questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Very nice. Uh, the questions will come up. Just one note for all the attendees. I mean, a number of them probably have been given the link uh, that I have, which means there are a number of people that are called Kedwin Junikota on the things, which is absolutely fine. But if you want to be uh, recognizing your questions, sign please the questions when you when you write. Some people have their own uh, uh, address, which means I can recognize. Um, while the questions are coming, um, I would like to ask you a very quick one. Given the fact you you quoted uh, Lecanemab uh, at the beginning, which has been uh, really a fantastic development. Now the peculiar uh, thing with this antibody, as opposed to others, which were uh, tried before is that it does selectively or preferentially interact with prefibrillar a beta. So in other words, I mean, that would basically target the same process that you would target by inhibiting ASC or NALP3, uh, on, you know, at the a beta level. Does this mean that in a way, if we try uh, to be able to develop NALP3 uh, therapies is a bit redundant with this? or you would target preferentially the IL-1 branch for tau, or do you think they are completely different uh, targets? Um, I believe that these are complementary approaches, and, I uh, and uh, there's uh, another paper which we published last year where we showed that a beta binding to ASC uh, makes it a super inflammatory molecule really harming brain function. So uh, I doubt that the antibodies would reach uh, such a high penetration that they would be able to completely restrict uh, the interaction between amyloid beta and ASC. I, I think you have to attack the system from both sides. We need um, uh, anti-ASC uh, spec antibodies because there is no good use for an ASC spec in a human brain. Um, and we need the anti-amyloid beta antibodies. And uh, together and in synergism, we'll probably reach uh, a high level of protection. Thank you. Okay, let's start. There is a question from Lucas Sekim Ribeiro. Uh, it says, thank you, Dr. Enner, for the interesting talk. Are there circulating peripheral proteins they have a higher association with the development of neuroinflammation, microglia inflammation, and therefore could be used as biomarkers? We know that we have uh, a number of circulating uh, uh, immune signals uh, of which uh, their contribution is not an entirely clear. Uh, we have better results if we analyze the cerebrospinal uh, uh, fluid, which requires a spinal tap. Uh, so we have identified um, kind of disease-associated um, immune factors, um, including the TAM receptors um, uh, that actually uh, show a protective microglia phenotype at the very beginning of the disease in patients that uh, just, uh, um, you know, are in the stage of subjective cognitively impairment. Um, at a later stage during chronicity of uh, uh, this um, uh, disease and the neuroinflammatory component, there are a lot of markers which are 
indicating a detrimental uh, effect and are linked to uh, higher degrees of cortical atrophy and, and disease progression and uh, cognitive decline. Um, still, we have no uh, none of these markers which we can determine in the periphery um, to make uh, a predictive assumption who would go uh, which way. So obviously, the immune compartment and especially the NALP3 inflammasome um, uh, can be read out in the CSF, but not yet in the periphery. And we are seeking those markers as we speak. Thank you. There is another question that reads: uh, Do ASC specs seed any extracellular amyloidogenic protein? That's a good question. So we have uh, uh, we have studied this uh, uh, in conjunction with alpha synuclein, and uh, their interaction with alpha synuclein is much less as compared to amyloid beta. But we are looking to a further. Uh, amyloidogenic proteins, um, and these studies are actually underway. Adriano. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that, uh, that we have performed a pretty extensive study with um, uh, ASC uh, inhibition in AA amyloid, uh, which is a systemic uh, extracellular amyloidosis. Uh, and this is there also, it's very clear that if you, I mean, uh, ASC knockout mice have much less AA amyloid after induction. And now we also have antibodies against the ASC and, uh, and the same thing happens. So the antibodies prevent uh, uh, largely the deposition of AA amyloid. Yeah, fantastic news. Very good. Additional questions? I don't see any more, so, so I would like to thank uh, Michael very much for his uh, uh, very inspiring presentation. And we move on to uh, the last one, which is going to be given by Professor Harald Kuss. Uh, Harald is a group leader at uh, the Design in Berlin, and uh, he's also the head of the Charité Outpatient Memory Clinic. Uh, is a consultant neurologist, and he has uh, dedicated a large part of his research efforts in trying to understand the role of uh, autoimmunity or antibodies which may uh, participate into the pathology and the progression of neurodegenerative diseases. So uh, he's sharing his screen now. Harold, go ahead. We are listening. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Pierluigi. It's a great pleasure to join this session, uh, and thanks also for the nice and introduction. It's a privilege, of course, to follow these, these great two talks. And I would now like to actually shift your attention to the humoral arm of the immune class, how specific antineuronal autoantibodies may contribute to neurodegenerative processes, including dementia. As some of you might have realized neurology, and, and I'm also a part-time clinical neurologist, has really faced a paradigm shift related to antibody-mediated diseases. And this is not only true for neurology, neuropediatry, neuropediatrics, age medicine, in particular our memory clinics. And as you can see here on this timeline, is in the last 10 to 15 years, almost an explosion of new specific antibodies. And basically every single abbreviation here stands for not only a specific antibody, but for a set of clinical symptoms, for a ver variable association with tumors, for a variable response to immunity. It's not even not easy for, for even neurologists to um, keep an overview of this still rapidly expanding number of antibodies. So that's why I would like to group them a little bit for you and also discuss those specifically where we feel that they might be related to energy generation. But I would like to start with one which is um, or has been the most exciting one over the last couple of years and also the most common one in clinical routine. And that is the NMDA receptor antibody discovered um, in 2007 in patients such as this young lady here from our intensive care unit with sudden onset schizophrenia form disease. And then she here in 
specifically was referred to a psychiatry inpatient ward where she then had a number of epileptic seizures and status epilepticus that's why she was moved to our intensive care unit and um, the interesting thing is that after many months um, of treatment it was still unclear what she had because this was 2001 so a few years because before the diagnosis became possible but we later found out from archived CSF and serum samples that in her cerebrospinal fluid and serum, there were high levels of autoantibodies against the glutamate receptor of the NMDA type. And we know nowadays that they're not only relatively easy means to determine these antibodies, and you see this here, we just take CSF it on the section of a, of, a, of a brain of a mouse or rat. And then if it's positive for NMDA receptors, for example, you see this pattern, which tells us that there's, this patient has NMDA receptor encephalitis. And we also know now, a bit more than 10 years later, that this is the most common type of autoimmune encephalitis in our part, part of the world. But Already at that time, we and others were asking the question if, if NMDA receptor antibodies are attacking the brain in the temporal lobes and the glutamatergic receptors are so important also for memory, is there also a subgroup maybe of patients where these antibodies contribute not to an acute, very severe disease, but to a more subtle, chronically progressing phenotype with, with memory impairment as, as the core symptom? And this seems to be the case actually in a series of uh, patients, almost 700 from different DZNE centers and other clinics, we realized that whenever there was an antibody against NMDA receptor of all three types, IgM, IgA, or IgG, and there was a high likelihood of having dementia. While patients without out neurodegenerative dementia, but other neurodegenerative diseases and other neurological diseases had much lower frequencies of these antibodies. And already at that time, 10 years ago, we started treating a few of these patients with high-level antibodies, such as this 60-something-year-old uh, lady with a suspected diagnosis of uh, frontotemporal dementia. And after bringing the antibodies down by several orders of magnitude using plasma exchange, we saw that even in this PET image where you measure glucose metabolism in the brain, you see that, that in the temporal and parietal um, areas of the brain, there's increase in metabolism, suggesting that removal of these antibodies was bringing back a little bit of the disrupted brain function. And there's interesting clinical evidence now accumulating in particular in the last few years from patients, for example, with stroke, but also from patients with cancer. I just give you an example here of a series of patients with lung cancer. And what you can see here is whenever there the presence of autoantibodies, risk of cognitive impairment was dramatically increased in case of non-small lung cell cancer. It's an odds ratio of 20 that these patients with NMDA receptor antibodies develop cognitive impairment. Su suggesting, for example, that what oncologists believe that this type of cognitive impairment brain fog mainly comes from cytotoxicity of the chemotherapy might not be true in all cases and specific autoimmunity with antibodies against NMDA receptors and further brain proteins might be the real cause for this very disturbing um, morbidity aspect in oncology. Uh, to other dimensions <clears throat> in, in dementia antibodies, I would briefly um, touch on, and that's viruses. You might have heard that herpes virus infection is um, uh, actually decades for a few, uh, discussed for a few decades that this might contribute to Alzheimer's disease. And this is basically based on findings, old findings that uh, herpes simplex virus Antibodies are more frequent in patients with Alzheimer's disease, but also that, that in the brain biopsies and autopsies of Alzheimer's patients, you find herpes simplex virus DNA in particular around not entirely clear what this means. So it's, as I said, it's a long debate and I would like to add another potential way how this might work, how herpes viruses might contribute to dementia and that's via antibodies. And that's on separate findings. The first finding is that herpes virus infection of the brain leads quite consistently to the development of NMDA receptor antibodies. That's something we found randomly in a cohort of uh, herpes encephalitis patients 10 years ago, and this was now prospectively uh, confirmed. 
And actually, it's that one in three cases of herpes encephalitis patients have severe NMDA receptor encephalitis later on, a few weeks later. So obviously, this is a very consistent mechanism of antibody production after herpes encephalitis. And then, as I showed you, there's ample evidence that NMDA receptor autoantibodies can directly participate in cognitive decline by regulating glutamate receptor. So potentially, that's a new mechanism and definitely worth exploring. And the second viral aspect is that, of course, not all, obviously not only herpes viruses can do that, also other viruses, including coronaviruses. And most of you might have seen this also with some concern also already in the first wave of the pandemic 2020, that there were these large epidemiologic studies showing that after coronavirus infection, COVID-19, you have a two to threefold increase of getting a diagnosis of dementia and a number of further psychiatric illnesses compared, for example, in this case, with influenza infection. And the question is, what does it mean? And is it simply or, or only due to the virus or may other factors such as quarantine and so on also contribute? But what is interesting from, from my point of view is that in a series of COVID-19 patients we looked at in 2000, 2020, when the pandemic also arrived in our center in Berlin, in Berlin, we saw that in this panel fluid of every single patient on ICU as of the virus, but with neurological complaints, such as cognitive impairment, delirium, epileptic seizures, in every single patient we found antibodies against the brain, such as here against Neuropeel in the olfactory bulb against uh, blood vessels in the brain, Purkinje neurons, um, cerebellar neurons, astrocytes, and so on. And it's not proven yet, but we are, still, we are working whether these antibodies directly participate in the clinical phenotype, in, in particular cognitive impairment and fatigue and headache, which we see quite commonly after COVID-19. And to answer the the question of whether these antibodies are directly pathogenic, we started a few years ago within the DZNE to build up a small scale pipeline for the recombinant production of patient autoantibodies. And what we do there is to take cerebrospinal fluid from patients with different diseases, including dementia. We then isolate plasma cells and B cells, clone the light and heavy IgG chains, put them back together in a dish. And this way, theoretically unlimited amounts of this monospecific human autoantibodies. And these antibodies then for the first time allowed us to systematically screen or mimic the patient's encephalitic and neurodegenerative diseases in mice. I just would like to give you one example of a recently discovered GABA-A receptor antibody targeting another very important receptor in the brain, not only rele relevant for um, psychosis, but also for epilepsy. and if we inject these antibodies into the brain of mice via little mini pumps, these mice develop epileptic seizures up to a status epilepticus. And this is quite helpful for us for at least two reasons. The first reason, we in this way understand how exactly the antibodies contribute to a clinical phenotype. And second, for us as clinicians, based on these findings, we can then really um, understand that it's needed in case in, in patients who sometimes have quite aggressive immunotherapy to remove these antibodies. We can use these antibodies also for another types of analyses, and I would just like to mention two quite briefly here, which have become routine now in our laboratory. One is that whenever we find in patients CSF, for example, from neurodegenerative dementia, such as FTD or AD or corticobasal syndrome, we find a new target. Then we now routinely run immunoprecipitation and mass spectrometry to identify the underlying target, because I think this is, of course, a central step in understanding the disease pathogenicity. In this case, it's, it's an axonal initial segment protein, TRIM46. And the other route of this um, trying to do more and more is to, um, to do cryo-EM, so cryogenic electron microscopy in this case, together with Brian Hibbs in Texas, where we used our GABA-A receptor antibodies to really demonstrate on an atomic level 
where these antibodies bind to the receptor to show the, the quite complicated three-dimensional structure of the epitope and to understand that in this case, for example, GABA binding, the transmitter binding was not possible because the antibody simply blocked the, anti the GABA binding pore. And this explains up to a clinical level why these patients have psychosis and epilepsy. And that's, of course, something we now try to do with, with many more of our monoclonal antibodies. Now I would like to share a few thoughts on specific antibodies. One of them is LGI-1, which actually in encephalitis patients is the second most common type of antibody after the NMDA receptor antibody. And patients with this antibody have a funny type of epileptic seizures, which you can see here in one of the first videos from, from Oxford more than 10 years ago. Have a look here on the left arm and the left face. These are so-called facio-brachial dystonic seizures where the patients usually 50 times per day, but sometimes 200, 300 times per day, have these highly stereotyped repetitive movements. This can also happen in sleep, as you can see here. And that's a, a seizure type, which you shouldn't overlook as, an, as a doctor interested in neurodegeneration, because while this at this step, the disease can be treated quite well with immunosuppression, it moves forward if untreated to a mimic of, of Alzheimer's disease, basically, because what these patients have is early on inflammation in the temporal lobes, where the highest expression of LGI1 is in the hippocampus. And after that, there is a, a rapidly progressing volume loss in the hippocampus, so hippocampal atrophy. And of course, on the clinical level, we see this as impairment and cognitive function in our memory tests. And it's important to understand that because from this cohort here of 30 patients in the, in the MRI scanner, we understand that this really is a process of the first few weeks. And that's why it's really important in memory clinics, in, in my opinion, to screen systematically for these antibodies in patients with memory complaints. Another even more exciting antibody is an antibody against EGLON5. This antibody targets a neuronal cell adhesion molecule, which here looks out of the neuronal cell. And the patients, again, have a relatively specific type of clinical phenotype with sleep disorder, with cognitive impairment, some uh, breathing abnormalities. But what is particularly interesting is that although these patient symptoms respond to immunotreatment, in the brain of those patients uh, who unfortunately died, neuropathologists found tau deposition. As you can see here, all the brown staining in the hippocampus, but also midbrain and brainstem. This is hyperphosphorylated tau. So from a neuropathologist's perspective, this is a tauopathy. And saying that is, is a neurodegenerative disorder. And the question, of course, was over the last couple of years, and I think we are now a bit closer to the answer, is what is hen and what is egg? Is there a tauopathy, which then drives a secondary autoimmune response, which uh, causes additional symptoms? Or is it the other way around, that you have the, the immune response first, and then EGLON-5 antibodies, for example, cause cellular stress and tau deposition? And to, to come closer to an answer, we did an experiment where we used our pipeline cloned 40-something um, monoclonal human EGLON-5 antibodies, which um, are quite diverse also in the epitopic spectrum, and used these antibodies and also purified IgG from patients to inject this into the brain of mice. And this is work done together with Susanne Wigman's group in Berlin. And interestingly, interesting, only the mice that received um, human EGLON-5 antibodies into the hippocampus developed tau deposition in this area, not antibodies that receive control antibody, suggesting that if this is confirmed in further studies, I mean, this is very early work here, but if this is confirmed in further studies and also in humans, this might indicate that there's a certain number of neurodegenerative diseases that are triggered by a specific autoimmune response, and that theoretically, if we cut off this autoimmune res response early enough, that we can prevent some aspects of neurodegeneration and tauopathy in these patients. This already has led to a change in our concept in the memory clinic. We know every single patient who comes in with memory complaints to do a spinal tap to look not only for neurodegenerative disease markers, 
tau and amid and, and nfl and others but also specifically look for outer antibodies and you can imagine the more we look the more we find and in this case um, I show you the picture here of a patient uh, with suspected frontotemporal dementia with typical clinical course, typical findings in MRI and PET imaging. And only in the cerebrospinal fluid, we found these strong antibody response, IgG antibodies against neuropeel in the brainstem, against granule cells in the cerebellum. And this is why we then treated him with therapeutic apheresis, washing out the antibodies, which in here led to marked clinical improvement. And that, there are now more than this patient. I give you just another example. A patient in his 60s with rapidly progressing nestic syndrome, um, quite bad testing and cognitive uh, tests. Um, the CSF tab showed neurodegenerative markers of Alzheimer's disease. And also the, the FDG PET showed hypometabolism in certain brain areas, which are suggestive Alzheimer's disease. So this was a, a differential diagnosis and then extensive in CSF and serum showed that this patient additionally had against KCNA2. So this is a voltage gated potassium channel, which um, we found with high, high levels in serum 1 to 1000 and 1 to 32 in CSF. And interestingly, this is an antibody targeting uh, a channel that already is well known to neurologists from genetic findings. So patients with usually children with genetic deficits in this have epileptic, epileptic seizures and also memory complaints. So this in a way makes sense, but of course this needs con con um, confirmation in clinical and work um, and this is what we're currently doing. And this brings me to a new a paradigm here, so I assume that antibodies can contribute to neuro neurodegenerative diseases. I personally assume that some of these patients have one antibody with an extremely high level and strong density, such as the NMDA receptor antibody, where then most of the clinical symptoms, including cognitive impairment, might be explained by this single antibody. This is rare, and I assume that in most other cases of this virtual spectrum, you might have a contribution, a combination of several antibodies, which then um, to altogether uh, lead to cognitive impairment or might speed up the neurodegenerative processes that, that underlie um, these mechanisms. So it's a theory. And of course, to prove this finally, we need to basically go one by one, every antibody, understand their target, understand their pathogenicity, and then at the end, come up with a model and with different combinations. And of course, a lot of clinical samples to confirm. But we started slightly slower with a uh, unblinded uh, trial at DZNE Berlin, where we recruited now with different types of cognitive impairment, usually Alzheimer's disease and FTD diagnosis. And all these patients had some or the other against brain. And what we did with these 20 patients is to characterize in detail their clinical phenotype, their degeneration markers, immunology, MRI, and then treated them with immunoabsorption, so washing out the antibodies from the blood in five sessions. And interestingly, 40% of these patients showed of the disease, and 20% even showed clinical improvement. And that's quite important because not a single dementia trial I'm aware of would aim for improvement. You, you're usually happy if the cognitive decline can be slowed down a little bit. And because of this encouraging findings, we are now planning a DZNE-wide DZNE multicenter placebo control trial, double-blinded, and we might probably not go for immunoabsorption because this is a lot of hassle with the catheters and takes a lot of time, also quite expensive, but to use more some of the more modern compounds, such as inhibitors of the neonatal FC receptors, which are now also approved in the US and in Europe for a number of um, autoimmune diseases. I would also like to share one slide on another strategy that we are approaching or using to specifically deplete some of these pathogenic antibodies, and that is double A CAR T cells. You might be aware of the concept of conventional CAR T cells. This is where you have um, the own body's T cells equipped with a construct that on top has an antibody fragment. And this antibody is used to specifically target tumor cells. And then the activation domains activate the T cell, which kills the tumor cells. Well, that, that's the current concept. And we turn this principle around having a double A CAR T cell, where we 
the piece of the NMDA receptor of this activation domain. And in this case, only NMDA receptor antibodies in the surface, in the membrane of an antibody producing B cell can bind to our AA CAR T sets. And theoretically then, specific B cells should be depleted and all the other B cells which are good for us after vaccination, after infections and so on, they should remain in the body. And as you can imagine, it's still at the, clin the preclinical level, the data are quite encouraging. So in vitro, these cells very specifically deplete the only the NMDA producing B cells, and also in mice, adding our CAR to B cell um, uh, transferred mice producing human monoclonal antibody. These CAR T cells can control the immune response. And I hope that we can also uh, confirm this in further experiments, expand to other targets, and then eventually have like a surgeon with a scalpel, a very specific treatment to remove only one type of antibody, because I think that's important. Um, in dementia patients because all the other immune treatments we have at the moment have a lot of side effects in long-term application. And with this one, uh, we might specifically target only one entity of antibodies. Let's see whether it's work. I'm more than happy to report this in the future. And uh, based on all these findings collectively, I would propose that we cannot, as, as has been done in the past, separate autoimmune diseases and neurodegeneration as strictly. Um, it seems to me that antibodies play a central role here, that we have more a continuum, where on the left-hand side, you see patients with clear autoimmune dementia, which is more or less a, a mimic of, an, of a, an encephalitis, for example, and their antibodies seem to explain almost 100% of the clinical phenotype here on the right-hand side where is classical neurodegenerative diseases, of course, with classical protein aggregation, misfolding, propagation, antibodies play, might play a less important role, but might still, if you also indicate, have, have seen indicated by the previous talk, might contribute to that, might either expedite or slow down protein aggregation, or might contribute to the clinical phenotype by other means for example, by targeting ion channels and receptors on, in the surface of neurons. And to come to an end, I think it's an exciting period also for people interested in autoantibodies to the brain, because as I said, now there's a lot of work ahead. We need to basically identify every single target, understand their clinical phenotype, understand their pathophysiological functions. But this, at the end, will give us a little map of antibody omics. So basically, to understand the repertoire of all the antibodies that are available in the brain, how they come contribute al alone or in, in combination to the clinical phenotype. And more or less en passant, these antibodies are also very nice tools for further discovery and my to develop new diagnostic neurodegenerative diseases, but also new therapies, including the AA CAR T cells, which I mentioned. And with that, I thank you very much for, for your attention and um, go back to Pierluigi. Thank you very much, Harold. Uh, our our um, uh, online um, big connection went lost during the meeting, so I'm just connecting now from my computer. Uh, the um, the uh, there is one thing before we start the questions. I think Adriano just uh, uh, in the chat indicated that um, they are also working on tau antibodies, and I think related primarily, if I understand correctly, to a broad. Uh, sample that comes into the hospital where you have detected um, antibodies associated with both vascular and kidney problem. Maybe you want to comment on this, Adriano. Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Harold. The fantastic talk, uh, absolutely exciting work. Uh, so congratulations and uh, very, Thanks. very innovative. And uh, and uh, so uh, you may or may not know that uh, uh, that we have established here um, a high throughput facility to uh, look at. Uh, autoantibodies uh, in very large uh, collectives, uh, up to 200,000 people. We have a biobank where we have uh, um, collected uh, uh, plasma uh, systematically from everybody who enters the hospital for the last uh, five or six years. And uh, so it's an enormous number of people. And uh, and we have all the, you know, the uh, microfluidics and so to do this very, very quickly. And uh, the and uh, so we have looked at anti-tau antibodies and I was a bit shocked to see that uh, 
I mean, five percent of people have uh, anti-tau antibodies, and uh, and really high levels, and uh, and these antibodies are super high affinity. I mean, we are talking about uh, picomolar affinities, and uh, the and it increases over time. I mean, if you look at a very elderly population uh, over seventy, over eighty, it goes up to uh, seven, eight percent, and uh, and then we have uh, gone back. Uh, to ask, okay, I mean, wh why were these people in the hospital? And it turns out that uh, there is a very clear association with uh, uh, metabolic and uh, renal diseases, and it's a syndrome that uh, is not has not been described. It's uh, so uh, so. I'm pretty excited by this. Um, I, I was thinking, uh, uh, first of all, I was thinking, asking what you think about this, and uh, second, obviously, we are uh, we. I mean, having this um, biobank, and so we are very open to all kinds of collaborations. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Adriano, for this comment. So I'm, I'm, I'm of course aware of, of your fantastic setting there and the, the previous work on this. And it's, I, I have two comments. So, I mean, this is really exciting. I, I fully understand that this concept might expand to other clinical entities. So if you see it now for, for internal medicine problems, kidney disease or so, I think the similar principle might work in the brain so that basically the composition of all these antibodies contributes modulates i mean it's 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 so many it's it's like genetics 20 years ago right. where we had first modifying genes and then we understand that this is much more relevant than we than we thought yes i think you you also analyzing csf but to a lesser degree right yeah, so because correct, yeah. interestingly in in patients where we compared antibodies from csf which is our main source in the patient's end and blood, that this is a very different repertoire. For example, some of the, the diseases I mentioned are uh, called IgD4 diseases because colleagues found that IgD4 is the main isotype, usually in serum. But when we clone these antibodies from CSF, IgG4 is very rare and, and we see IgG1 or 2 and 3, but not IgG4. And also the affinity and the epitopes are quite different. The number of hypermutations are very different between blood and CSF in, in, this, in the antibodies targeting the, the same target. So obviously these two compartments are very different and it would be fantastic to, to work together more closely and find out whether this is a common scheme, whether then there is this hypermutation going on in the brain, for example, in patients with dementia and encephalitis, and how this connects to, to a number of clinical phenotypes. Fantastic. <laughs> so I think that uh, there, there is really potential there. And um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we have a question from Paolo Salomoni. He asks, is there any evidence of increased B cell accumulation in CSF? And if so, which kind of B cells? Right. So in, in the encephalitis, which of course is not neurodegeneration per se, but a good model for us, there's almost always in these cases a B cell accumulation in the brain. So this can be naive B cells, but, but mainly memory B cells and also a lot of plasma cells. And interestingly, now as we expanded this to other entities, we also quite regularly found to a lower number B cells in the brain of, of neurodegenerative pac patients, in particular of patients with ALS. So this is where we, so far in every single ALS patient or almost ALS patients where we did a spinal tap, we found some B and also plasma cells. Okay, there is another question. Uh, in your mouse experiment, do the Ig lon 5 antibodies enter cells to seed tau? So, so as I said, this is very early experiment, so I cannot specifically say this for the Eglon 5 antibody, but what I can say is that many antibodies we have, which also I showed the TRIM46, for example, which is an intracellular target. And we have other antibodies against synapsine, for example, which is also an intracellular target. And there was this, um, this I would say, textbook knowledge for a long time that antibodies which target an intracellular epitope cannot reach this in vivo, in, in the human or in the mouse. But this is obviously not the case. So we see if we infuse the antibodies into the brain via little mini pumps, then we see that all these intracellularly binding antibodies can reach the target in the cell, suggesting that we can... I think rethink about approaches where we target intracellular epitopes with antibodies. Okay. Do we have any more questions?
not. Perhaps I can ask just one last one. I mean, it's interesting uh, that some of the uh, autoantibodies that you have identified interact with uh, glutamate and MDA receptors. Now, we know that in the, uh, in the very early phases, at least, I mean, it's, it's been shown in different systems, we can have an hyper in, of uh, Alzheimer's disease, we have an hyperexcitability situation. Are these antibodies uh, functionally active in, uh, in opening the, or gating the, the NMDA receptor or, or vice versa? So obviously these, these antibodies are also, it's not one homogeneous entity. So some um, seem not to activate or, or inhibit the receptor directly. It seems that others do this a little bit, but the major, the major aspect of these antibodies is receptor internalization. Um, and this again is not done by every single antibody, but that's the main effect here. Different to example, the, the GABA-A receptors, which I showed antibodies, which directly activate the receptor within, within a minute, uh, but that's not the case here with, uh, with the NMDA receptor antibodies. Very good, thank you very much. Is there any other question for, for Harold? Okay, so if not, I would like to invite everybody who has additional question to all the panelists to uh, to sort of ask the question now. So this includes also the uh, previous talks. I see Adriano is online. Uh, I hope Michael is uh, listening to us as well. Uh, so is there any other questions from um, uh, for the speakers uh, before we end the session? I don't see anybody typing in, so let's just draw a little bit of, of some conclusions. I would say that this is, uh, at least in my perspective, one of the most exciting fields developing in general in, in brain science, but particularly for neurodegenerative diseases. I mean, it is, um, it is remarkable. I mean, Adriano and I were discussing many years ago, we basically were saying, well, there's been a lot of research in uh, neuroimmune interaction for our, for multiple sclerosis, for example, and yet I think you know that was very much focused on one disease, and now it's pretty much obvious that we know so much more about uh, the uh, interactions between the immune system and the nervous system in several diseases, uh, systemic diseases and brain diseases. So I would say that the uh, the um, uh, findings we've heard today. Are, uh, are extremely important and are driving research towards more and more towards this area, which is the interaction between the nervous system and the immune system. Obviously, we haven't touched at all here on the other branch of the interaction. So how the nervous system affects the immune system, which is also another very interesting component, which in many studies is becoming more and more important, especially in diabetes and other type of research. But I would say that the um, future therapies for neurodegenerative diseases will not be without an arm, which will uh, interfere with immune responses, because I think this is a key component of the development of disease, whether it is propagation and spreading of misfolded proteins, whether it is interactions with the surface receptors, uh, whether it is the uh, possibility of uh, facilitating or inhibiting replication of uh, uh, pathological proteins or autoantibodies like we heard from Harold. Uh, there are other components we haven't touched, like the complement. Uh, for example, which has been uh, uh, also um, postulated to be part of neurodegenerative disease. So this is, in my view, a field which is going to expand more and more. And in combination with the agents that may remove misfolded proteins like uh, uh, antibodies or other uh, treatments, I think we will be able to uh, produce an amelioration of symptoms in these conditions. I would like to leave it to Adriano and to, and to Harald if they have any additional comment before we close the session. I see that Michel Henneke is not connected. Uh, so then I think it's the two of you, if you want to add any additional remark before we close uh, the symposium. I mean, I can only just agree, Pierluigi, what you just said, that I think this, this interaction between immune system and nervous system will really keep us busy in the next couple of years with, with a lot of interesting findings. Yes, and I can, I can add, I'm sitting here on the chat, we already, uh, there is already interest of people in 
collaborating with uh, Adriano concerning his uh, beautiful library. I think we're doing that already, as I said, in Tübingen, but I had a number of other colleagues here uh, who were asking about the potential use for screening purposes. Maybe we should organize a meeting then to discuss uh, collaborations in addition to what we have already with Adriano. So I would uh, stop it here then. I would like to thank all of those who have been attending. We have had an average of about 70 attendees to the symposium, which is, uh, which is quite good. Uh, next week, there is gonna be the concluding uh, major symposium in Milan of the, um, of the uh, Prada initiative. I think this is extremely important if, uh, if uh, uh, the private sector becomes interested more and more into trying to help solve neurodegenerative diseases, but also in general investment in science. Uh, public investment in science, especially in the uh, current situation, uh, are dwindling. So I think that the involvement of the private sector in this would be extremely important. So we look forward to the meeting next week, and we would like to thank you all, the speakers and myself, for all the attendance, the participation. I personally would love to thank all the speakers for the effort they put in their beautiful presentations, and I wish you a very nice end of the day.